need an introduction, so I'm not gonna. We'll get into the topic of how do the senior operators plan to execute the strategy. There's a question therein, of course, that assumes there is a viable, readable, understandable strategy, and I suspect these guys will address that in a little bit. <clears throat> As I was thinking about how to start this off, I remembered what General Eisenhower said. He said that the plan isn't worth anything. The planning is worth everything. And those of us who, in our later years, spent some time with some of the Jedi Knights from the United States Army realized how important it is to certain elements of our joint fighting, coalition fighting forces strategy. For a lot of us, when we were growing up, when I was flying wing on Tom Mercer, for example, strategy was the daily flight schedule. That's about as far in advance as we looked. It's a different world out there today and needs to be. And so I'm going to ask each one of the operators to my left to address their view of the current maritime strategy and how they, as in the operational chain of command, expect to execute whatever the strategy is. Right off the bat, the Air Boss, Dave Buss. Thanks, Admiral. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be uh, uh, back with you. And I want to start with a word of thanks to the U.S. Naval Institute and, and all the sponsors for putting on a terrific show again this year at West. This is a really important event for uh, all of us, active duty, retired, our industry partners, uh, academia, and so forth. So it's great to be with you again uh, this year. Um, as Admiral Keating said, uh, I'm Dave Buss. I'm the Air Boss, Navy's Air Boss. I've uh, been in the job about 16 months now, so uh, I'm about a tenth of the way through my tour here in San Diego. Plan on staying for a long, long time. Um, and I wear actually two hats in the, the current assignment that I'm in. Uh, I've got Title 10 responsibilities. I'm responsible for manning, training, and equipping the uh, Naval Air Forces uh, today. So I've got readiness uh, responsibilities today with the aviation force across both our aircraft carriers as well as our squadrons. And then I've also got an eye towards the future as the community lead for naval aviation. Uh, I work with CNO and Fleet Forces Command, Admiral Gortney, and Pacific Fleet Commander, Admiral Harris, on uh, trying to put together and then articulate the vision for naval aviation for the future. So uh, both those jobs keep me uh, pretty busy. And with respect to the maritime strategy and where we're going for the future, I'll take my slice of uh, the Navy, which is naval aviation, and just highlight a few things that are either in transition, uh, challenges and opportunities that we have today and where I think we're going for the future. Uh, first and foremost, there's no doubt, and if you were here yesterday morning for uh, DepSecDef Christine Fox's kickoff uh, keynote remark, uh, she hit this right out of the blocks about the, uh, the nature of warfare over the course of the last 12 years or so. And out of necessity, we've had a land centricity to uh, our focus for naval aviation. That's meant supporting troops on the ground, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, in a relatively permissive environment. And as I look into my crystal ball and I think about the future of warfare, and in particular the future of the naval aviation dimension of warfare, that is not the environment that we are likely to find ourselves in the foreseeable future. So uh, less permissive, uh, less ground centricity, less focus exclusively on air-to-ground operations, and uh, more multi-dimensional multi-warfare. And if you believe that, that's guided our thinking, my thinking in particular, on trying to articulate the future of naval aviation and where we need to be headed. We're in a remarkable place today in naval aviation. We are in transition to a new type model series uh, across almost every single community in naval aviation. I'm the beneficiary of some tremendous visionaries that preceded me in this job and others that uh, saw the opportunity, saw where we were with our current aviation force 10 or 12, 15, 20 years ago and put in place the programs and the new platforms and new sensors and weapons that we're bringing online now and will continue to for the future. A few examples, we continue our transition out of 
uh, legacy F-18s and into Super Hornets. And even older lot Super Hornet squadrons are transitioning into newer lot, more capable aircraft. And we'll continue that transition for a number of years. Uh, we're almost out of the venerable EA-6B Prowler. In fact, the last carrier-based squadron will deploy later on this year with the George Herbert Walker Bush Strike Group. And by this time next year in 2015, we'll put the Prowler to bed and complete our transition into the extraordinarily capable EA-18G Growler. I'll circle back on that theme in just a second. We continue our transition into the P-8A Poseidon. In fact, we've got the first deployment uh, underway today. We're about two and a half months into the first operational squadron, VP-16, with a P-8 forward deployed in 7th Fleet in the Western Pacific and doing terrific things. F-35C is on the horizon for us. We stood up the FRS, our fleet replacement squadron, our training squadron last October down at Eglin Air Force Base. We've taken delivery of our first couple of aircraft and we have a plan to transition our first fleet squadron here in a few years. Our transition into E-2D, the Advanced Hawkeye is well underway and that's a terrific enabler and the quarterback for the fleet, I call her, for the future. Uh, for this high-end warfare uh, environment that we need to be prepared for across all dimensions and all domains, the E2D will be central to everything that we do. We're completing our transition out of old legacy uh, and multiple platforms in the rotary wing community and into the MH60 Romeo and Sierra. We've stood up both carrier-based squadrons. We're complete with that transition across all our air wings, and we're in the process of transitioning our final few expeditionary squadrons for both the Romeo and the Sierra. And probably most exciting to me has been the advent over the last couple of years of uh, remotely piloted and unmanned systems. We're bringing Fire Scout online. In fact, I had the great privilege uh, last May to stand up the first composite rotary squadron here in, at uh, NAS North Island, HSM-35, that will deploy next year in LCS with the MH-60 Romeo and Fire Scout side by side. And we're going to learn an awful lot from that deployment. And you saw last year uh, that we did what I called arguably the most difficult thing in naval aviation. We launched and recovered an unmanned system, a demonstrator on the East Coast uh, on the George Herbert Walker Bush with UCAST X-47 as we prove that we can get that vehicle on and off the ship, arguably the most technologically complex and warfighting environment that exists. So we're off to the races with unmanned systems, carrier-based, and we're in the process of completing our test program with Triton, our theater ISR asset that will augment the P-8 and P-3 communities, the maritime patrol community for the future. So. Very exciting times, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention also our transition into a new type model series in our carrier fleet as well. We christened our next generation aircraft carrier, the USS Gerald R. Ford, CVN-78, in November. We continue outfitting with her, and we'll have her in service in the fleet here in the next couple of years. So very exciting times in naval aviation. But what I've just described are the platforms. The, it's the stuff, it's the hardware. Uh, the most important thing is how we're thinking about using and the uh, concept of operations that we're developing for using this new hardware in the high-end domains, the high-end fight that I, that I talked about uh, is our future. Uh, I mentioned less permissive. We are refocusing within naval aviation. In fact, uh, a little bit of back to the future going on in developing the types of skills that we used to have in the air-to-air -air arena and uh, in the anti-submarine warfare, the undersea domain arena back from the Cold War. Obviously, as we look around the, the globe at potential adversaries and those that would build keep-out zones to try to prevent us from operating or uh, dominating locally battle space, uh, we've got to think differently about how we train and how we outfit ourselves for the future, and we're doing exactly that. I look forward to your, your uh, questions along that regard. Um, I'm thinking differently about electronic warfare and, and how we manage and where we need to to dominate the electromagnetic spectrum for the future. No surprise to this group that many of our potential adversaries are de uh, devising capabilities to deny portions of the electromagnetic spectrum to us, uh, 
and we're operating very diligently now, both with the systems that we have online today and the systems that we'll develop and field tomorrow to uh, bring back capabilities to dominate locally the electromagnetic spectrum. I think differently about sanctuaries for the future. I mentioned this permissive environment, which we've been operating for the last 12 years or so. I believe for the future, we're going to have to carve out pieces of the domain in which we need to generate effects both kinetically and non-kinetically, build small sanctuaries that are available to, uh, to us in time and space for finite periods of time, generate the effects, and then those sanctuaries will collapse and will move elsewhere in the battle space to, uh, to create the same kind of effect. That requires us to think differently about things like cyber and how we will use our tactical assets, the VAQ community, in the future. I mentioned two transitions that we have going on in particular as we transition into uh, the EA, EA18G Growler, uh, the youngsters in that community, the young smart minds of the lieutenants that are bringing that, that great platform to bear have just started to scratch the surface in helping us think through how we will dominate the electromagnetic spectrum and generate the effects that we need to for the future. As we move out of the current legacy pod system, ALQ-99, that we have in, in the Prowler and Growler community and into things like Next Generation Jammer, it opens up a whole new set of possibilities in terms of local dominance of the electromagnetic spectrum for our future to generate the kinetic and non-kinetic effects that we need. And I'm very excited about that. We're just getting going with, with that journey. The other piece of future warfare in naval aviation that I believe is extraordinarily important is uh, sensing, understanding, and knowing what's going on in your battle space. And this gets to ISR, ISR assets, how we think about uh, shreds of information, data, intelligence and fuse that information into a coherent picture that allows us with the greatest extent that we can to understand and sense what's going on, who's operating in our battle space, what their intent is, and uh, what effects we need to generate to counter that intent where we need to. So when I think about battle space awareness for the future and I think about capabilities that we're bringing online both in terms of our unmanned systems from an ISR perspective, or E2D to be able to uh, generate the effects and, and really maximize the range of the sensors and weapons of the naval aircraft that we'll have operating in the battle space. The E2D uh, will be a remarkable, remarkable capability and it'll bring the entire picture together. And the importance that the premium that we place on all assets, whether it flies or sails in the battle space, to have the right protocols and the right uh, uh, data links and so forth in place to share information and fuse individual shreds of, of information into a coherent picture will be will mark our success in this high-end battle space that I talk about for the future. So I'm very excited about where we are. We're focused on things like kill chains and completing kill chains for the future. Naval integrated fire control both from the sea and from the air is, a, is an area where we're doing an awful lot of development and how we exercise blue kill chains and deny red where we need to, uh, the, the completion of their kill chains is, in my estimation, the future of warfare in naval aviation. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Admiral Copeman. Hey, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks to, again for uh, Pete Daly and the Naval Institute for putting this on and giving us operators a chance to uh, give you a, a couple of minutes on our thoughts. Um, and I think it's important to have the operators up here because we certainly, we look at the exact same sentence, the exact same piece of data, the same Rorschach ink blot that somebody in the Pentagon does and we interpret it very differently. So I think it's important to have us up here to, to give you a different viewpoint on the exact same information that we all look at. Um, you know, like, like my aviation counterpart over here, the Air Boss, um, I have two, two hats that I wear. One's the man training and equip and primarily execution year and developing uh, the, the fit up budget for man train and equip for the Pacific Fleet Surface Forces. But I also wear the hat as the, as the SWO Boss. Um, I won't use Admiral Gortney's uh, call sign for me. I don't want to reinforce him. <laughs> yeah, too late. Anyway, so, the, so in that hat, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, the future beyond execution year, beyond the fit up. What are we going to do 10 years from now? What are we going to do 20 years from now to meet the strategy? Um, the surface fleet that we have sitting in the harbor right now is going to be primarily the surface fleet 
that we're going to have 15, 20 years from now. So we've got to make sure that we wring the most out of it. And there's a bunch of uh, efforts in the short term that we're working on. Um, the surface force comprises 73 percent of the commission ships in the United States Navy, and we subsist on less than 20 percent of the budget. So, uh, and we provide the vast majority of the presence throughout the world. And so we're, we're, we're an important existential part of the United States Navy. Um, the range of missions that we conduct in phase zero are almost endless from sleet slot control, counter piracy, and you know, we, we can call an audible and, and do uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief on very short notice because of just the, the nature of the fact that we are out there in such great numbers spread around the world. Um, no one else, really. There's no other Navy. There's no other surface Navy. There's no other Navy combined with all their other forces that can do what we can do on any given time. And we work in very close partnership with, with my air boss buddy here because uh, his helicopters are, are quickly becoming the, the iconic picture of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief around the world. And we're, we're a pretty big carrier of those uh, and spreading them around and making sure they're in the right place at the right time. To execute the maritime and national security strategy, the surface force must be able to provide the best trained sailors and the most well-armed ships that we can afford. Um, like everyone else here and at this table and in this room, uh, we have serious budget issues that we have to contend with. And I, I do not think that we are going to see an increasing budget scenario any time in the next 20 years. So we have to be, think very, very sharply on how in the short term and the long term we can squeeze the most combat readiness out of the forces that we have right now and out of the future forces that we are intent on building. Um, in the short term, the surface warfare uh, enterprise uh, is, we're starting up a command called NSUC here pretty soon in the not too distant future, which will uh, refocus us, uh, which we kind of lost when the wall went down, refocus the surface warfare community on tactical training and making tactics the main thing. And we've, we, we stole the page from the, out of the uh, NSOC page playbook there on that. And I think it's gonna be a great effort for us in the future. Um, a little bit further down the road in conjunction with CFFC, you know, it's this concept of how do we get the most out of what we have. And the optimized FRP is one of the issues that we've been working very closely across all the enterprises and with CFFC to make sure that we, when we do send ships out, that they are manned up at the appropriate time with the correct number of people, with the correct experience so that they work up as a team and then you get the most out of them when they do go on deployment. And we've got to get our maintenance done on time, on budget and on schedule to support this. So that's a, that's a big short-term effort. And then you start looking uh, into the longer-term efforts. You look at the, a lot of the stuff here in this room, the technologies that I think we have to uh, utilize but across all the spectrum, from weapon systems all the way to how we train uh, our workforce. We have to do a better job. We can't just do brick and mortar uh, in three or four different places in the world. We have to get accurate computer-based reality training out in the fleet concentration areas and on the ships, because we can't, we can't afford to steam the ships at you know $100,000 a day for a, for a DDG or a cruiser just to do engineering drills. We can, we can do it sitting in port just as realistically as we can underway. So that's some of the stuff we're working on. Um, like my fellow panelists here, and I'm sure that they'll all uh, share the same thing, uh, the, we, have, we do have significant budget and manning issues well out into the future. Um, the oceans aren't getting any smaller, as a matter of fact, they're probably getting bigger with global climate change. Um, and we must think of new and innovative ways for future weapon systems, for future ships. How can we get a increased or hold the same relative combat capability with less people on them? How do we do that? LCS is one of the, I think, the cutting edge of this. Here we've got a ship that we've designed from the keel up to give you a two for one forward presence. And what do I mean by that? If you have 50 ships, 25 of them are present all the time by design because we built them from the keel up to do so. Um, you'd need four, four times as many single crewed conus based ships to achieve the same forward presence. So I think it's, and, and it's a relatively inexpensive platform. I'm not comparing it to the, wep to the weapons or to the missions that a DDG or a cruiser can do in the high end war fight, but it certainly is every bit as capable of doing every phase zero and phase one mission that we ask our DDGs and cruisers to do right now. So uh, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to my very good friend and former Liberty buddy, Pink Floyd, and so we'll leave some time for questions. Pink. I'm in. Uh, well, just like, uh, just like the Air Boss and the Sea Lord, uh, I want to thank Admiral Keating and the, uh, the Naval Institute, ABSEA, and of course all the sponsors uh, for putting this on every year. You know, at, 
a, uh, su such a, a venue where we can have a uh, public and, and a candid uh, dialogue is really important to the, to the Navy uh, and, and to the nation uh, for that matter. And thanks again for bringing it to San Diego. It gives the opportunity to a lot of our folks that otherwise wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to make it. So thanks so much for that. So from a third fleet uh, perspective, I'm, I'm focused primarily on three things. Number one is uh, leading naval operations in the Eastern Pacific. You know, it's about 53 million square miles from the West Coast out to the International Dateline and, and doing uh, Im important operations, maritime homeland defense, maritime security amongst others. Second, I, I, I wanna make sure that we continue to provide realistic and relevant training for our forces that are heading west, that, that proven combat uh, power, credible combat power that we send out over the horizon is important around the world. And then the third thing would be building partnerships. And, and I'm talking uh, not only international, but, uh, but joint and across the interagency as well. You know, CNO has, has, has said for many years now that you know, it's war fighting first, operate forward, and be ready. And I think that the three focus areas I just mentioned uh, is, is how Third Fleet will, uh, will get at executing uh, that strategy, not only here in the, in the Eastern Pacific, but around the world, because that's, that's really what a global Navy does. Now, I mentioned building partnerships, and, uh, and I think any strategy is going to codify the Navy's most important partnerships, and that's those with the other naval services. You know, operating on the West Coast, uh, we have a really important relationship with the Coast Guard, for example. We train with them, we operate with them, uh, we deploy with them, and our capabilities and authorities complement each other in what we're, what we're doing here off the, off the West Coast. But in my mind, no partner is more important uh, to the Navy than, uh, than our Marine Corps. And uh, John Tulin and I work pretty closely together. Uh, I give him many opportunities to ridicule me, and we're just talking about going to golf courses, and that's another way of doing that, I think. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the Navy Marine Corps team, in my mind, is, is a hell of a lot more than a phrase or a goal or just putting sailors and Marines together in, in gray hulls. You know, it's, it's about a combat capability forward, and our readiness and our efficiency when we talk about it is our, not, not mine, not John's, uh, and, and we go from there. So to answer the question, I guess the topic of this panel is, is you know, how will we execute the strategy? I, I think that we'll, at Third Fleet, we'll continue on that training and readiness focus uh, for, the, for the high end fight. Uh, we'll do that with many, many partners, some of them much closer than others. And, uh, and, and to the extent that we, that we succeed or fail in that, of course, will be across, across all of the Naval services, I think. So anyway, that's, uh, that's all from me, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Bing. General Toole. So uh, I think uh, Kenny set me up, said that Tom was a sea lord. I guess that means I'm the landlord. <laughs> <laughs> But really, uh, when we, the Marine Corps' uh, moniker recently, as you probably heard, is today's fight. What is today's fight? Today's fight is Benghazi. Today's fight is Lebanon. Today's fight is South Sudan. Today's fight is really all over the globe, but in an awful lot of places that are in pretty bad shape. We need to be ready to take handle today's fight. We didn't do such a good job in Benghazi. We need to do better. With today's force, today's force is phenomenal. We have tier one forces. We have the smartest, most enthusiastic young Marines and sailors you could ever possibly want. There is no problem. And even with the downsizing, what we're finding is we, we're even able to maintain the level of the force at even higher levels. And today, being able to get to the fight today, and how do we do that? Through two means, really. Forward presence is, is, a, is a primary way of doing it and crisis response coming to space, and having the capability to get out of town quickly. The forces in, in one MEF are on a, so we have forces on a, as early as a six hour string to get out of town. So today's fight, today's force today, that's the way we, we plan on doing it. Now the strategy, the implementation of the strategy, in many ways you've heard operational maneuver from the sea. In today's day and age, particularly with anti-access denial the, the denial fight, you know, we've been driven a little bit further out. 
of our, uh, over the horizon. But still, the capability is to be able to operate from the sea. And the Navy makes, that strategic, makes those strategic maneuvers for us to get us close enough to the shores, to the objectives. The way we've been fighting in crisis response, in particular, is through the Marine Expeditionary Unit and Amphibious Ready Group and the deployment of those assets every six to eight months. But what we found is that the method of how we employ those is changing. It used to be you could operate with a three-ship, four-ship ARG MU, and they would be able to take care of business. Today, because of the demands all over the Central Command, for example, same in PACOM, is we're having to operate split ARG, disaggregated, and in many ways what we're calling distributed operations. And so it changes the dimensions of how we load the ships, how we put equipment on the ships, and how we deploy them. To the point now where, for example, our maritime raid force used to be on one, one ship. Now we've got it spread loaded over two. And if we could spread it over three and find a way to get, you know, aviation assets across to some of those decks, we'd do that as well. The, Another way that we're fighting is we're looking harder at how we integrate with Special Operations Forces. At one point in time, we had the Marine Expeditionary Unit Special Operations capable. When the Marine Corps developed the Mars MARSOC, Marine, Marine Special Operations, it changed the dynamics a bit. Well, just recently, we've worked in an arrangement with SOF that now we have SOF elements as part of the ARGMU that when they deploy, tie in directly with the theater, secure, theater special operations commanders in each one of the combatant commander AOs. It's going to pay dividends. The first time it's going to happen is going to be with the next deployment of 11th Mu. Theater security cooperation, as, as Kenny highlighted, is very important. And how we get to the various theaters in order to work with and build capabilities. As we get smaller, it's going to be more and more dependent upon our allies and partners and friends throughout the globe, particularly the Pacific, to be able to help us and join, join in, in in operations and exercises. So theater security cooperation is vital. As Admiral Copeman talked about, you know, there are a variety of different platforms that we can use. We just uh, commissioned the, US, the John Glenn uh, two weekends ago. A, a multi-landing, multiple landing platform ship that has phenomenal capabilities. It's time for us to get these ships out there and exercise with them and see what they can do. I, I'm, I'm anxious to be able to put forces on the LCS and be able to sail those ships down to South America to conduct South, uh, theater security cooperation. But we have to look at alternative platforms because we just don't have enough of what we need right now. Connectors is another vitally, vitally important area in regards to how we would fight. How would we get to the fight? And as many of you know, we, we relied a lot on our amphibious platforms to self-deploy off the of ships. But I think it's time for us to start working a little more closely with our Navy partners to, to discuss connectors from ship to shore utilizing naval assets. Uh, our amphibious vehicles are getting a little old. They're 45 years old, to be exact. And we need the way to get to shore, and we need to be able to build relevant combat power quickly. And how we do that is going to be something we'll be discussing in towards the future. And I think I'll leave it at that, and then hopefully open it up for any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Uh, as the moderator, I get to set the rules of engagement <clears throat> with Pete Daly's support, of course, Admiral. So what I'd like to do is ask everybody, if you, as you have a question, we're not going to do that uh, voice of God thing, as Mike mentioned. We're just going to rely on you to stand up, you know, kind of bang them together, and let make sure we can hear your question as well as uh, the tape guys can hear your question. So we'll, we'll start taking them. And always the first question is the hardest one to get going. So. Uh, I reserve the right to ask not the first, but the second question. The first question will be audience participation. And it, it's one of the most vexing, probing questions of, the, of our time. And so I would ask you to respond if you agree with me by raising your right hand that Pete Rose does indeed deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. If you think Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame, raise your right hand. If you think that he has no place in Cooperstown, raise your left hand. 
It's a better day for Pete Rose than, <laughs> than he's enjoyed in my experience. Okay, uh, for the, each of the panelists, uh, in the circles where I get to run these days, many folks will say, w weren't you in the Navy once upon a time? I'd say, I, I was, though for the last 10 years or so, Navy guys didn't see much of me. And, and two, weren't you in the Pacific? I said, yes, I was. Well, what is the Department of Defense doing different today with our national strategy emphasizing the rebalance, I think re-emphasis is a better word, on the Pacific. For each of you guys, what, if anything, do you see occurring in your particular specialty, area of responsibility, job jar, that is different today than it was three years ago? Well, thanks, sir. I'll take first swing at that pitch. And I am uh, lived in Cincinnati for nine years as a kid, so I'm a big Pete Rose fan. Um, within naval aviation, uh, the, the rebalance has, has uh, held and will continue to hold very uh, tangible outcomes for us uh, as we work our way through uh, force structure decisions and so forth. I suspect we'll see uh, a, a, a shift in our carrier force structure to continue to support operations in the in the Pacific, the Western Pacific, and. Uh, and also, very tangibly, as we field some of the new capabilities that I talked about, the new platforms that I talked about, to the extent that we can, and this is, uh, this is a very high probability with each one of these new platforms as we bring them online, the initial deployments will be to the Western Pacific. So I've got a very uh, close partnership, as I know my other uh, type commanders and, and uh, uh, and Admiral Floyd does as well at Third Fleet with the Seventh Fleet Commander, and to the extent that we can give him new toys to play with and new capabilities to play with to experiment in the theater, in situ, uh, that's very important. I highlighted the fact that we've got the first P-8 operational deployment over in the Western Pacific right now, and we're learning an awful lot and we will continue to as we continue to spirally develop that, that airplane uh, over the course of the next couple of years. We'll deploy uh, as I mentioned, a littoral combat, combat ship with a, uh, an aviation detachment with both uh, manned and unmanned systems here next year. That's an important new capability that we're bringing to bear in the Western Pacific. So, sir, I think to your, to your question, as we think about the high-end fight, as we think about the rebalancing, as we think about the importance uh, of the Asia-Pacific region uh, within naval aviation, we're bringing those new capabilities to bear just as quickly as we can. Thoughts, Tom? Yeah, what's different now uh, than three years ago, there's a, there's a bunch of things that are different. Um, I think first and foremost, we have a pretty cogent strategic laydown plan for the entire Naval Force, including the surface force, on what ships are going where. And we've, em we've emphasized, the Navy has emphasized putting our most capable uh, warfighting platforms forward uh, to the FDNF and also here in the Pacific Fleet. So we're, we're in execution on that. Um, I, I think we've also, what's, what's been fairly significant from my standpoint is the number of non-SWOs that are now talking about recapitalizing the offensive punch of the surface fleet, which we've, um, we've let languish over the last couple of decades. So um, I think that's an important aspect for us to, to be viable in the Western Pacific because of the, of the, the potential uh, war fighting that we may have to do out there. So uh, there's, you know, there's a limited number of aircraft carriers. They, we have put most of our offensive surface, our air to surface punch uh, or sea strike in there for very good reasons. Um, but there are a limited number. And I think with, with you look at the number of the surface ships that we have out there, um, it, we need to recapitalize our offensive capability. And we've, we're doing that in many different ways. Um, so I think those are the two main differences that I've seen. Thanks, Tommy. Pink, thoughts? I think that I think that the only thing that I would add to that is my, my concern at first was that maintenance and and whether maintenance would slow down uh, and then impact our ability to get trained to have the time to train to meet the drumbeat to get out over the horizon on deployment uh, that I have not seen that I have to say uh, it's or I haven't seen it to an extent that was not easily uh, dealt with but you know Tom mentioned uh, in his opening remarks, the OFRP. And that is going to go a long way towards, towards a, I guess, building more efficiency into a pretty good process uh, right now. Uh, ex experimentation, 
uh, high-end training uh, would be absolutely the same on both coasts uh, for the betterment of the, of the front-end warfighter. So I, I, I think that's about all that I would add. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a concern, uh, but from a, from a training standpoint, they're as up and as ready as they've ever been. And from my perspective, uh, you know, the Defense Policy Review Initiative, which is something that was signed way back in 2006, is starting to get some serious traction. For example, new airfields starting to be built in Okinawa. Uh, Iwakuni's changed dramatically. There's been a lot of positive changes, which is starting to open up the distribution. Again, you hear that word distributed operations of Marine forces in the Pacific. As of April this month, we will have 1,000 Marines now permanently rotating forces into Australia. If you look at a map, Australia is key to any way we want to go in Southeast Asia. So it's going to be a very close and tight relationship with the Australians, but it's positive. Uh, five years ago, we only had one infantry battalion in Okinawa, Japan. Today, we're back to four. And we're rotating. The MU cycle is continuing to operate pretty aggressively out there. Uh, we have now just transitioned and put two squadrons of MV-22s out in the Pacific, which I think many of you realize changes the whole dynamic. It's the reason, the only way that the relief forces got to the Philippines during Operation Damian was by those Ospreys being there. So those are some very positive shifts in the Pacific, from my perspective. Thanks, John. Over to the audience now, and I would ask uh, if you're inclined to give us a speech, uh, please resist the inclination. Let's try and keep it to a question. If you would, please, out there. Yes, sir. Right out of the chute. Thank you. My question is, there's been several recent criticisms of the P-8 and then ongoing issues with the LCS by uh, in the press and from DOD, and I wonder they see things wrong with these platforms. You're seeing a lot of things right with these platforms. How do we go about closing the gap between how you view their doing and, and kind of the, public, the, the publicity and how we can lose a lot if we lose that battle? Go ahead, Tom. I'll start first. Yeah, there's uh, certainly no secret. There's been a tremendous amount of criticism from the operational test and evaluation community, and it gets into the press. And, and I think it's important to keep in mind there's about an 18-month lag between when they do this test and it gets leaked to the press. So we, we do actively fix issues as they come up. Um, in the littoral combat ship, we must prove the combat viability of the SUW, the anti-submarine warfare, and the um, mine countermeasure mission modules. And we're doing that. Um, the Fort Worth is underway right now doing IOT and E events for the SUW increment two uh, mission package. The ASW mission package for the littoral combat ship will be a multifunction towed array sonar, an SQQ-89 Victor 15, which, which will be in a 20-foot container, and a continuously active uh, variable depth sonar, and it's going to have an SH-60 Romeo. All four of those systems, have already, three of them have gone through OPIVAL and have been proven combat effective uh, by, the, by the very same folks that were are, we're being slowed down since we're putting it on a new platform. We basically start from scratch. So it's not a matter of uh, if we're going to get this combat capability in littoral combat ships. It's, it's just a question of when, and we're, and we're working through that. We start operational testing on the mine countermeasures in the Gulf of Mexico later on uh, this fall. Um, so I, I'm pretty confident about it. I mean, we've built this ship to, in, to rapidly insert new combat capability as it comes along. Um, and, and I think if we can get the whole system to realize that and that we can modify the acquisition the way we acquire, because rapid right now is that when I, when I talk about rapid, it's a completely and utterly different time frame that somebody on, in the Pentagon talks about rapid. Um, when I think rapid, I'm talking a year. When they say rapid, they're talking three, five, six, seven years, and that, that's not what this ship was built. So I, I, it, again, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when, and we're, we're stepping through the steps that we have to step through, and it's going to be an important capability for us. It really is. We're going to, just in manpower of savings alone, if we go to the program of record with 78 crews of 70 people, uh, 52 ships, it's about $700 million a year less in manpower that you would have for 52 DDGs. Not comparing to missions, we're not getting rid of any DDGs, but it's an important consideration as we look at either static in real terms or decreasing 
shipbuilding funds. We have to think about building ships with less people on them because people are expensive without decrementing too much capability in the aggregate. So there you have it. And Jim, if I could just add, and I own just a, a smaller slice, but obviously the preponderance of the discussion here is centered on uh, Admiral Copeman and his portfolio. But from the aviation perspective, uh, and this gets back to the multi-dimensional uh, nature of warfare in the future, I really firmly believe with LCS that uh, we, we've done some parallel path development in our concept of operations with each one of the mission modules. And uh, the impacts for me in the aviation community are to make sure that I have the manned and unmanned piece right of, uh, to, to be able to support that. So uh, both Admiral Copeman and I have been pretty articulate that as we've done this parallel path development, we've got to do the proof of principle with all the pieces pulled together to make sure that we've got it exactly right. Part of that will be done forward. I mean, we've learned an awful lot, I think, from the first LCS deployment over in 7th Fleet. We'll continue to learn now as we bring more aviation assets on board, and we'll make adjustments as we go. I tell folks all the time, I can guarantee you with 100% certainty, we don't have this 100% right today. But as long as we do the integrated testing, we bring all the pieces together, and we learn and adjust as we go, we're going to be just fine. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Jack, but before you go, sir, I'll speak for Pete and all of us here in thanking you for your support over the years for the Institute. You, your support has made a difference, and we're grateful. Your question, sir. Thank you very much, Admiral. Am I on? Thank you. And uh, good morning. Thank you for being with us. Um, information dominance, EMS issues. I'd like to ask you to reflect a little bit on that and how it uh, enters your strategic planning, your maritime strategy going forward. Information dominance, where it fits, what the implications are in your strategic planning going forward. Pink, do you integrate that in your third fleet training to get folks ready to go west? Information dominance. Have any of you all ever seen that movie, City Slickers? <laughs> you know, it's a, I'm, I'm a Billy Crystal fan, and they're, they're, they're out and they're doing a cattle drive, and Jack Plants plays this old cowboy guy. And, uh, and Billy Crystal has this dialogue going with him about, you know, how, how come you're just kind of, you know, moping along here and, and, uh, and, and life is good for you. And he says, well, it's all about that one thing. And Billy Crystal says, excellent, what is that one thing? He says, well, you have to go figure that out, you know? So information dominance and, and all of the ways that we do that, in my opinion, is that one, is that next big thing. You know, when we went from sails to steam and, and oil to nuclear power and jet aircraft, all of these things that the Navy has led the way in, I think that information dominance is, is our next, next big uh, area of warfare. Uh, we train to it. Um, it's, it's a hard thing to train to because it's a tough thing to measure sometimes uh, out in the fleet, but it's, it's, it, is at, uh, it is definitely in play, let's put it that way. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it's always a chance to talk about Billy Crystal. And, uh, that's right. <laughs> That, that is the challenge, that is the challenge. Uh, like I say, we, we exercise it, how we would use it strategically, and then it, then it really gets into the gaming world, I think, to, to get it, how we're gonna move forward with it. I've been out of the flight suit business for a long time, but our son does some flying today, and he's out working up, on, just finished working up on George Bush, shortly went out to see him, did a bunch of other guys. And one of the best emails I got from them was, they have shut everything off on the George Bush. We're having to drive around without tack in, without uh, sins or whatever you call it these days. And it's hard for those guys. Well, some of us grew up that way. We were happy to have a tack in on. We do all sorts of things. So the fleet hasn't forgotten entirely about some of those lessons, at least observed and probably learned, and are working through what used to be Second Fleet under Shortney, now under Shortney, and out here under Pink, to re-emphasize certain of those very hard but very important lessons when you don't have all the electrons flying around. So that's first-hand evidence that they're, they're working on it out there today. Over in the back. Wait. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, with, the, with the reallocation of you know, the budget and funds and cutbacks that we hear about, 
and those that you have to face. Uh, I'm also going to say, is there any reallocation of the things that you have to cut to put on information systems, cyber, cyber warfare, and to improve and put us on the cutting edge like we see other people like NSA and other people are, is there a, I'm gonna say, is there a thrust? Is that being cut or do you plan to put more, more emphasis uh, in that area? Thank you. Well, if I could, I'll start just uh, from the aviation perspective and then let my fellow panelists uh, chime in. And, I, and I'm glad you asked the question about the current fiscal environment because uh, uh, it's one of the things that, and each one of us, I think, can talk about both impacts and effects that we've seen and what we see the future looking like. Within my aviation portfolio, uh, we made do last year. It was a tough year, no doubt about it. Um, and we had, if you remember about this time last year, there was talk of uh, shutting down cold iron up to five air wings in our Navy. Half of our naval aviation force structure parked and mothballed. We ended up not going there. We were able to get some resources back and we, uh, we funded uh, naval aviation. If you weren't in the workup cycle or on deployment, then we funded you what we call tactical hard deck, which is uh, about roughly 11 hours per air crew, per pilot, per month, which was enough to maintain a basic level of safety and, and basic proficiency in the aircraft. It's not ideal, but success is relative. And based on where we were a year ago, we ended up relatively okay. Uh, when the, the Bipartisan Budget uh, Act was passed uh, several weeks ago, um, while there were some things not to like in there, as a manned, train and equipped type commander, I was thrilled because I had the readiness resources, at least for this year, to fill in some of the divots that we caused last year. So my aviation force is pretty happy today. We've lifted folks out of this tactical hard deck situation. We're training, we're regaining qualifications, we're making up for a little bit of lost time from last year, not entirely. There's some things we'll never recoup because there's an opportunity that's now we're past an opening on. But directly to your question about reallocation of resources, you know, the thing, and all of us live in a world where we have to, we have to keep a foot in two different camps. We're in the here and now, and we have to keep an eye on the future as well. So I think it's extraordinarily important in my portfolio that we continue to buy new, we continue to recapitalize, and we continue to make the investments in the enablers that we know we need for the, high, the potential high-end fight of tomorrow. And that's information warfare, information dominance, the, the right systems that I talked about. If you believe what I said earlier about this idea of creating small sanctuaries in time and space where you have awareness and then you have the ability to dominate with the effects that you need to generate, that leads you down a path of having to make investments in the enablers and the links between platforms and sensors to be able to do business in, in that environment. And it's a trade-off. You'd like to have more hardware, but if the smarter investment is in those kind of capabilities, this is funding the lightning bolts, as Admiral Gortney calls it, and to do that properly to make sure that we're well enabled to operate in that high-end environment is smart business for the future, and it's a trade-off. Yes, sir. Yeah, this one's for the Airbus. Uh, commercial aviation's about to experience a pretty significant departure of uh, their senior folks due to mandatory retirement. Uh, given the FAA uh, changes to the minimums required, that's going to put a bullseye right on Navy, Marine, and Air Force aviation. How's the health of the pipeline? Uh, what are you going to do to retain key guys? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a terrific one, and I get it on a pretty regular basis. Were you the same guy that asked me this question at Tailhook? Um, <laughs> So here's what I would say, uh, and I'll give you the bottom line up front. I, I am concerned. You can't pick up an issue of Aviation Week any week without uh, reading an article about the current and future demand for commercial airline pilots. Uh, as you rightfully noted, the FAA a number of years ago lifted the age cap to 65, but all the Vietnam era, era pilots now are starting to, to uh, age out. And so that's starting to put a, 
uh, some stress on our force. I'm seeing the leading indicators, and this is a duck we routinely shoot about two years behind, but I'm seeing the leading indicators already of uh, not only the young junior officers, and you know, we've been, I've seen this movie before in Naval Aviation, um, but also our more senior folks. Um, you know, folks who are finishing squadron command at 20 years of service, and now because of the new age cap, have a viable 20 year career or so in the commercial airline industry. The one thing that I offer, that we offer within the Navy and within Naval Aviation, that you will never find anywhere else is the culture, the camaraderie, the focus on mission, the warfighting spirit, and if you've been in a ready room, that which makes a ready room in naval aviation very, very special. And I made this comment at, at Tailhook in Reno in September, and I stand by it. Uh, I have yet to meet the first airline pilot who was a former Navy or Air Force aviator who comes up to me and says, hey, Admiral, you know that thing we had going on in Ready 6 on Eisenhower back in the early 1980s? I've found exactly that same thing at United Delta Southwest. And so that is our competitive advantage. I mention to the youngsters all the time, I own the culture in naval aviation. I sublet that to my squadron COs, air wing commanders, and so forth. But that is our competitive advantage right there. And I think as long as we're clear-eyed and talking with each one of our cadres, our youngsters who are reaching the end of their, their minimum service, uh, the squadron commanding officers, those who are looking at other options, and we keep highlighting what is different and unique and very fulfilling about naval aviation, I think we'll be okay. Let me ask John Tulin at the end, while you're a proud infantryman, John, to be sure, is this an issue that has implications, much less ramifications for you as one MEF? Have you seen it yet, or are you worried about it, the, the, the exodus to the airlines? Sir, I, actually, I haven't seen it, and uh, so have not really been worried about it at this stage. Question? Uh, yeah, another one for the Airbus. Uh, you guys leave me alone. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, COD replacement. Uh, I know we're looking at the C2 update or possibly going to an mm -hmm. Osprey. Uh, who makes the decision on that? What's the time frame? And is the Navy looking at any other, other possible uses for Osprey? Okay, thanks for the question. For those who uh, may know or not know, as I, as I mentioned up front, we're in transition to something new in almost every type model series. One that I did not mention, obviously, was our carrier onboard delivery, the C venerable C2A uh, Greyhound, which is, uh, quite frankly, starting to get a little long in the tooth. Um, I'm not at liberty to talk about specific programmatics because we're still uh, culling through all the data and very much in the analysis of alternatives. Uh, I, th I think probably most are aware that we've done uh, a couple of fleet battle experiments over the course of the last year with operating uh, MV-22s at sea off the flight deck of, of aircraft carriers, both east and west coast. And each time we do that, we learn something new that we didn't learn before. Um, there are some options in front of us. One is to remanufacture, uh, revitalize the, uh, the C-2. Uh, there's a lot to like there in terms of commonality with our E2D in terms of engines and avionics and so forth. Uh, so there's an economy of scale issue there. MV-22 offers uh, similar advantages. The Marines are already well into it. We've learned an awful lot about how to uh, own and operate that, uh, that aircraft. So we continue to cull through all the data. Uh, I think we're, I was just back in the Pentagon last week, and I think we're probably a year or so away from making a decision. Dave, let me, from the cheap seats, I, I don't know if this is true or not. I have heard that the F-35 engine is big and poses logistics challenges for the carrier force afloat. Um, if that's a true statement, what do you think could be fixes for getting motors to carriers? Yes, and, sir. and if it's a V-22, I don't know. If it's a COD, I don't know if it can fit in a COD now or not. Uh, I'd love to hear from Admiral Copeman on that one. No, no, I, uh, 
uh, yeah, the, the high power module in particular and the F-135 engine, which is the, the engine that goes in the, the F-35, is, uh, is a beast. And uh, we're working through a range of options. We've got some concerns right now, some technical and engineering challenges with uh, how we move that, that engine module. Now, I, I should say right up front that the engine is designed and we're working through all the reliability numbers and so forth now, but the engine is designed with enough time on wing that it should be the rare exception that we swap these things out on the ship. And if it proves its salt in terms of reliability, then, then uh, you know, this could not be, or, or may potentially be not the same kind of issue we have with today's legacy engine. So we'll see where, where all that goes. But uh, we've got some challenges right now just based on the size of that module in uh, streaming it, highlining it from a support ship to the carrier in a, or a big deck amphib in, a, in an unrep, underway replenishment environment. And we also have some issues with slinging it, fitting it internally into either a C2 or an MV22 or slinging it underneath just because of the weight and cube. And we're working through all those things right now. So we're, okay. we're pretty close with uh, Pratt & Whitney, who's the uh, uh, developer, and, uh, and working through all that right now. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir, in the back. I, this, this is maybe one for Admiral Copen, but we haven't heard a lot about uh, unmanned and autonomous underwater vehicles, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how those fit in, in say the medium to longer term as a force multiplier and maybe on the information dominance front. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're in the surface warfare uh, sphere of influence. We're, we've already got a couple, you know, the, the RMMV that hauls around the 20 sonar for the mine countermeasure package on this LCS, uh, we got Mark 18s that are out in the Gulf right now that we can throw off a 11 meter rib and do mine hunting for us. And so we, we're we're in conjunction with the with the underlord, the submarine boss, who's uh, been given primary responsibility for the development of this capability. Um, we're, we're working hand in hand with them. Uh, unmanned surface, unmanned undersurface, and unmanned air air vehicles. It's going to be a big part of our ability to deliver uh, combat capability and, and conduct uh, ISR in, in across all the domains in the future. So we're working very closely with uh, with everybody involved in it. Yes, sir. Uh, Scott Kinner with uh, the Marine Corps Tactics and Operations Group. Uh, General Tulin, sir, a uh, quick question. We have great PowerPoint slides regarding um, the Commandant's vision for aggregating and disaggregating combat power downrange, uh, having company landing teams all over, um, and being ready for today's fight today. But in the actual short term, in the next five years, uh, you brought up connectors, MLP, um, some of them operationalizing the uh, prepositioning forces. Literally in the next five to ten years, how do you see us actually making that vision work with our naval partners? <clears throat> well, well, obviously, we're, we're still working very closely on the MU arcs. Um, one of our challenges is being able to get a MEB amphibiously moved uh, from CONUS to, a, to uh, a particular site. So, so there's some challenges there, and, and, and we need to practice it. We have some exercises coming up where we'll be able to put the MEB and be able to co-locate um, the Expeditionary Strike Group, uh, the ESG concept uh, is, is, is evolving, uh, and so w the future may be that a much tighter naval marine integration uh, on that staff to, to work the command and control. As far as the actual mechanics are concerned, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have some challenges. There's a triad of how we get from ship, from ship to shore. We use uh, aviation with the Osprey. We have uh, you know, our LCACs, which are our connectors, and then the AAV. The AAV is getting old, and we probably have, you know, five to eight years left of life on it. And so we need to find something to replace it. We're looking hard at some commercial off-the-shelf solutions to that problem. Uh, we're also, as I mentioned earlier, working with the Navy to see if there's some opportunities to develop jointly connectors that can bring larger amounts of combat power ashore much much more quickly, particularly when we have the environment of, a, of an extended horizon. You know, 65 miles now is, is not too close, um, or is 
could, could be potentially too close. But operating from 65 miles and being able to use that triad to get combat power ashore is going to be our challenges and, and things that we need to work through. So it's going to require continued integration with Third Fleet, one MEF, uh, in doing those exercises and testing those alternative landing platforms, et cetera. Because in the near term, uh, I don't, unless Admiral Coleman can come up with a couple of billion dollars, you know, we're not going to be able to uh, build additional amphib ships. But there are some things on the drawing board. Admiral Daly, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. This question for uh, Admiral Floyd and General Tulin. Last year, we heard a lot about single naval battle and haven't heard too much about that lately. Want to know if, if that's still a going concern and if there's pieces of that that we're starting to integrate, if it is a concern that's ongoing, are there pieces of that that's starting to train to uh, as we push out uh, capability here with arc mews and uh, carrier strike groups? Well, I'll say, I guess I'll just start off with, you know, sing, single naval battle is, is absolutely essential to the way we do business, simply from the fact that, you know, we're not going to be operating, we don't want to be operating from the shore. We want to be operating from the sea. So sea basing becomes a vital element of the whole single naval battle concept. Uh, we are in the process of building ships and expanding our sea basing capability, but we're not there yet. Uh, and we need to practice it. Um, I think uh, our commitment to single naval battle and the integration of the naval force is really what the two of us are driving towards with our exercises coming up. No, nothing really to add to that other than, uh, as, as John had mentioned earlier, you know, we're looking at every platform, every opportunity uh, to, to try to, to work together as we get, the, as we get our team back. And, and it is a, it's a combat capability, you know, it's not a Marine and the Navy, it is, it's us, the team, going out there and doing this. And just, you know, and of course the other element of this is, you know, bringing in all our coalition partners in this concept, I think is, a, you know, a vital aspect. Admiral Mercer. Uh, this is mostly for Admiral Floyd, and then I'm sure there will be comments from others. Uh, this, of course, is a uh, RIMPAC uh, year, and I know this is a different crowd than we might have had yesterday at luncheon and different emphasis, and uh, uh, just uh, another budget question, really, but also with the uh, China plane, just uh, how big is uh, RIMPAC going to be this year? Is it going to be just a shadow of its uh, former self, or, uh, or we got the money to... Uh, to do it right, and how much are we going to show and expect to see from the uh, from the Chinese? Rim, RIMPAC is is bigger than it's ever been. Probably, uh, we're looking at uh, 23 nations right now, and I think it's it's still to be determined. We're not announcing who's bringing what, nor as we kind of work through the planning process of that. But the final planning process will be here in April, and I think that the word will come out shortly thereafter on, on uh, what every partner is bringing uh, to include the Chinese. Uh, uh, from a money perspective, it's a, uh, you know, every nation will have their own answer to that as, as to how they want to spend their training dollars. Uh, but for us, it's that, it's that opportunity to, to get out there and build the trust and confidence with the partners that we'll work with uh, uh, when we're out there. I think that uh, to that extent, having the Chinese participate is very valuable to us uh, from, from that perspective. Uh, it's been great working with uh, them as well as all the partners so far. Uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to having a successful exercise here in just a few more months. It's going to, it's going to be an opportunity to, to, to also test some of those connectors that we were talking about. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, this exercise. Air Boss just mentioned something to me. Uh, and if you can, can you repeat you or Pink what you just mentioned to me, yeah, David? I'm sorry. Oh. The, uh, I can say that uh, Ronald Reagan will be, the, uh, will be our aircraft carrier participating uh, in the exercise. Uh, and, and I'm glad that the Air Boss pointed that out to me because I, I seldom miss an opportunity to mention when one of our aircraft carriers is participating. 
uh, because we still center our operations on that. Uh, did you have anything else to add? To yeah, that and then I was just going to add that, uh, and I, th I think you all probably uh, saw the press release a number of weeks ago that Reagan will become our next forward deployed uh, aircraft carrier over the 7th Fleet AOR in Yokosuka, replacing the George Washington. So and nations participating in RIMPAC, this won't be their first and last look at the USS Ronald Reagan battle group. That's great. Are we done? Thank you so much, no, no sir. We've got, we still have about seven, eight minutes. Uh, but I do have a question. Uh, you've, you've talked about a, a, lot, a, a range of, uh, of uh, scenarios here in the last uh, 30 minutes or so. I'd like to ask the panel, uh, as you look at that strategy ahead, what is this, the single thing that keeps you up at night? Start at that. You want to go there? Go ahead, John. I, I, I honestly, I, I think I may probably in my comments today, I probably made this clear, but but operational mobility for the Marine Corps is critically important, and we we've got a lot more work to do uh, to be able to be responsive. If we say we're going to have today's fight, today's force today. Um, we're still uh, woefully short in our operational mobility. So whether it be ships or airplanes, uh, we, we've got to build that fleet back up. I guess I would say that, that they're all fully up, fully trained, fully loaded, and ready to go as they are when they show up uh, in, in the AOR. That, uh, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that, and we do a lot of work towards ensuring that's, what, that's what's happening. There's a lot of stuff that keeps me up at night. Um, I mentioned one of them, I think, first and foremost, is, uh, is going to be our ability to recapitalize the offensive punch of the surface fleet. I think it's uh, very important for us as we move into the future. As the, uh, you, you can spend a lot of money on defenses, and as Admiral Locklear said at the Surface Navy Association in his keynote speech, you can defend yourselves right to death. And so we have to be able to, because um, you run out of weapons and you can't afford them. So um, we have to. We have to expend some resources and some energy, I think, to, to very uh, smartly recapitalize the offensive capability of the surface fleet. And, it, and it's not, and I think it's, it's all sorts of different ways of having, having missiles and that can do more than one thing and uh, investing in electromagnetic rail guns and, and investing in solid state lasers that will replace defensive weapons in your v in the 8500 VLS cells that we have that are um, that we could replace with offensive weapons so it's, it's a very complicated um, calculus to work through but that that's probably one of the main things I think that that keeps me up and then you know the re every we all all of us in this room are kept up by the uh, the resource levels that we're going to get and what are they going to be and, and how well we predict them and what's going to happen and stuff because there's a there's a set amount of money that we have and there's a set amount of money that you have to spend to, to maintain a certain amount of readiness and if that pot keeps dropping down at least in my world um, I, I worry about how much force structure I have and you can get into this spiral where you don't have enough to operate forward and be ready and, and put war fighting first so that that's the stuff I worry about the most. And I'll take a slightly different tact on the, on the question. You know, we've spent a lot of time in this panel talking about the stuff, the hardware, and the dollars, the resources. Uh, my, my concern is the people. We have, a, I think, uh, since World War II, we have, our Navy and Marine Corps has shown that we'll, we'll figure out the stuff piece. You give us the right tools, we'll figure out how to make all that work. I'm concerned about the people. Uh, a little known story in the last 12 years has been the extraordinary price that has been paid by our sailors and their families alongside the Marines, the Army, the Airmen, our Coast Guardsmen, and our civilians that have done an awful lot in our two land theaters for the last 12 years or so. Um, my concern's about the people. So we've seen deployment lengths grow. We've seen, over the last several years, a lack of stability in schedules, whether that what was a deployment schedule or when you were back home. And so I think driving some stability and predictability into how we 
get ourselves ready, and then how long we'll be gone once we go. We'll figure out the missions when we get there. I don't mean to be uh, glib about that, but we have a pretty good propensity for that. We'll figure out how to employ all the new tools. But uh, we've exacted a pretty high toll on our folks at every level of the Navy and the Marine Corps over the course of the last 12 or 13 years. So um, we can have all the glitzy new toys and all the con ops in the world, but if we don't have talented, hard-charging, patriotic, dedicated sailors, and by extension, their families and brother and sister Marines partnered with us, then we're going to be in real trouble. So that's what I keep my eye on more than anything else. Uh, thank you all for spending time with us this morning uh, for your questions that weren't statements. Uh, I don't get to spend as much time as I would like with brothers and sisters in uniform these days. I miss it. I'm the first of five kids, grew up in Dayton, Ohio. This will be a little bit of a speech. Uh, and, and in my mom and dad's older years, they would say to the, Helen and Jack, what are your, you know, you had a bunch of kids, what are they doing? They would say, well, Tim's an admiral in the Navy, Jeff's a college professor, Jerry's a surgeon, Dan B's an engineer, and Sarah teaches special needs children in Cincinnati. And mom and dad's friends would go, oh, oh, Tim is still in the service? And, and, and I get to say, you bet. And so to be able to spend time with these warriors here and with you reminds me of how grateful I am to have been born here and to have served with all of you. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your service. Peter, thanks for this opportunity. We're very grateful to you. Thanks, everybody. Great job.